Um, I'm very pleased to be here tonight. And uh, first of all, I'm pleased because uh, people have seen fit to hold this lecture in honor of my father. Uh, secondly, I'm pleased because this lecture has come about uh, because of the joint efforts of the Center for Policy Alternatives and the UBC Department of Economics, two quite different groups, but uh, uh, ones that my father belonged to, and he really valued being, uh, being part of them. And third, I'm sort of particularly pleased that, that Bob is, uh, is giving this lecture because um, my father just had such respect for Bob and uh, his work and his friendship and his hiking companion uh, qualities and all, all kinds of things. Um, as an economist, my father sort of shunned labeling himself. About two years ago, he uh, gave a talk and was asked uh, what kind of an economist he was. And this is what he said. My research has been largely in the areas of business cycles, the concentration of ownership and control of business firms, how to reduce poverty, inequality, and unemployment, and the role of governments in dealing with these problems. So you can see from the summary that I am left-leaning. So that's how he, in his rather understated way, sort of described what his life in economics was about. But behind a lot of things that my father did, whether it was in the university or in the community, there were really high standards of ethical behavior and research and scholarship. And he also held <coughs> deep feelings uh, about social justice and really felt, a, I think, a personal obligation to confront unfairness in order to make a difference in the welfare of his community. Within the university, he was, he was quite outspoken in his defense of faculty rights and academic freedom. He was also seen, I think, as uh, fair-minded and independent. And because of this, he was sought out to chair panels uh, resolving academic disputes. And uh, some of his reports really established principles that are used across the country for, for dealing with conflicts that involve academic freedom. Uh, sometimes, though, this independence, I think, could be irritating to his colleagues. His, his very first act upon being elected president of the uh, Canadian Economics Association was to cancel the Royal Bank's long-standing sponsorship of the association's annual dinner. <laughs> and, um, you know, he, uh, ever since then, members have had to pay their own tab because he certainly wasn't going to be beholden to any bank, uh, even, even for a free meal. So he, he firmly believed in using research and evidence to, uh, to test theories and assumptions that are behind the dominant economic and social perspectives that now shape uh, our political landscape. This invariably made him unpopular on the right. Uh, but occasionally on the left as well. Uh, while generally he, I think he was correct in his observations and analysis, it was sometimes at the cost of being politically incorrect. He recognized that people on the left often or sometimes took positions that couldn't withstand the scrutiny of good empirical analysis. But in meetings, if someone made an assertion that he felt wasn't really well-founded, he could often move the discussion forward with a timely observation or a question, or most effective of all, it was a, a quizzical raised eyebrow. <laughs> and, uh, so anyone who worked with him, colleague or student, I think soon found out what his standards were, and his standards were very high. He believed in research that was rigorous and thorough, and he applied these standards not just to his academic work, but to the work he did with unions, with the CCPA, and in the articles that he wrote for progressive magazines and newspapers. He didn't believe in dumbing down ideas to a public audience. Rather, he thought that uh, people could and should understand the important issues of the day. And if those issues were complex, 
they could be broken down into understandable parts. As he made the transition out of the university and started writing more and more for broader audiences, he also started giving me drafts of uh, copies of the articles he was writing and asked what I thought. And I don't know if this was his subtle way of trying to educate me, or more likely, I think, uh, he thought that if I, as a sociologist, could understand these issues, <laughs> well, then surely to God anyone can. So, <laughs> I think an event like this is a wonderful way of remembering my father, his values, and his scholarship. And speaking for all of the family, we'd like to thank Seth and uh, the UBC Economics Department, uh, David Green, and uh, particularly Bob, and everyone else who was involved in making this event happen. So thank you. Well, you're all anxious to hear from Bob and not from me, so I will not take very long. But uh, we would be remiss if we didn't uh, properly introduce our speaker tonight. Uh, Bob was a great colleague and friend of Gideon's for many years, uh, but Bob is also a leading academic, in fact, one of the world's leading economic historians. And uh, I just want to lay out a little bit of uh, the, the kind of geography of Bob's career. Uh, Bob spent 25 years in, as a faculty member in, in UBC and had a tremendous uh, career as a historian working on European economic history, on uh, the economics of the Soviet Union, on uh, uh, medieval wage and prices and many, many fascinating topics. Uh, ten years ago he moved to Oxford where he's now a professor of economic history. Uh, he has a spectacular uh, vita. Uh, he's not only concerned with, um, as um, we, we heard, things uh, like uh, the s social change and, and public policy, he's also uh, made uh, major contributions to uh, to intellectual economic history. Uh, he's a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada, a fellow of the British Academy. Uh, he's received many, many prestigious awards. Uh, he's given invited lectures all over the world. He's currently president of the Economic History Association. He has uh, many books and dozens and dozens of uh, research papers published in, in leading journals. Um, so I um, uh, as I understand, uh, the, uh, uh, Bob's talk tonight is going to be based roughly on his most recent book, Global Economic History, a very short introduction. Uh, so that's what I've given now. And uh, <laughs> before, without further ado, I'd invite Bob up to talk to us. Thanks very much, Mick. Uh, it uh, <coughs> really is a great honor to be here. and. Uh, I thank uh, the Economics Department, the CCPA, uh, the Alumni Association for inviting me. Uh, it's a particularly great honor because Gideon was such a great economist and such a great friend. We had uh, lots of good hikes and rock climbs together. And uh, in addition, we worked uh, uh, for quite a few years on uh, uh, BC economic policy issues. And I remember him, well, the themes, the things I remember him, the things that Seth and David have mentioned about him, that a tremendous sense of social justice, and also combined with a, a, a great concern for the facts uh, and a, a, a requirement for a rigorous, uh, clear, logical thinking. Uh, he was as uh, critical of uh, sloppy thinking on the left as he was on the right. Um, but he did think, uh, I think, that uh, good thinking actually could transcend to some degree political differences. And one of my favorite um, uh, stories about Gideon uh, was uh, uh, occurred in the in the mid 1980s when we were starting our uh, our policy work and uh, we didn't really know what we were doing and we were keen to to speak to any audience imaginable to get our message out and uh, we see we received a, a request for someone to come and address a luncheon meeting of the BC Conservative Party uh, which was not a great political force and not our natural uh, our natural audience at the time but uh, Gideon went to talk to them. And uh, he began, he, he told me afterwards, he began his remarks with a little joke. 
And the little joke was this. He, he, he said that uh, as a, as a longtime uh, uh, supporter, member of the NDP, uh, he was pleased to address uh, uh, the, uh, a group of members of the political party that had done the most to advance the cause of socialism in Canada. <laughs> and, uh, he mentioned the Canadian National Railway, uh, <laughs> Ontario Hydro, the CBC, TransCanada Airlines, all of these uh, crown corporations established by uh, conservative governments. And at the end of the le uh, his remarks in the question period, someone in the audience put up their hand and said, well, it's, it's uh, true, Professor Rosenbluth, that uh, conservative governments did these things, but they didn't do them for any ideological reason. He said, no, of course not. You did it simply because socialism made good sense. <laughs> so I'll always remember uh, Gideon's little joke. <laughs> um, so uh, it's a high, uh, but this, the, this uh, requirement to, to uh, be concerned with social justice, uh, rigorous thinking, and the facts is a, is a high set of hurdles. And I don't know whether we'll clear them, but uh, we have them in mind today. So one of, the, one of the big kinds of inequality in the world and one that concerned Gideon is inequality between nations. We have some nations that are very rich and other nations that are poor. And so why is that? How come the world is like that? That's our question. And uh, I'll just, uh, to begin, these are some data that, uh, that help me outline the problem. These are per capita, these are not robust data, but these show per capita incomes for a number of different countries here from 1500 to the present. And the first thing is that if you go back to 1500, the difference between the rich countries, the richest countries and the poorest countries is only about 50% in income per head. It's not very much. Um, so by 1800, that's to say as the Industrial Revolution is underway, uh, the gap is widened. And the, the rich countries like Britain and the Netherlands are about four times richer than, than the poorest countries. So there's a first kind of divergence there, which is what I'm going to focus on in the first part of my talk. But then what happens after from 1820 to, until today is this gap explodes. And the countries that were richest in 1820, they've, they're up at the top and they've got incomes that are 20 times higher than the poorest countries. Uh, so, so the gap has ero arisen because the rich countries in 1820 by and large have all got rich. The poor countries have got a bit more prosperous but not nearly as much so the difference is much greater. Um, that's the general pattern. There are a few exceptions that you can see. Uh, Japan, for instance, was a really poor country in 1820, and it's a rich country today. So it's not only the broad pattern you want to understand, but the differences as well. So um, why, why are some countries rich and some poor? Uh, technological change is the fundamental cause of economic growth. And uh, Countries that are rich have uh, become rich by uh, inventing and using highly capital-intensive technologies, while poor countries continue to use very labor-intensive technologies. So, for instance, the question is, why do rich countries use highly mechanized power looms like these, whereas uh, in Ethiopia, 300,000 people still weave cloth on hand looms like those? Um, that's the kind of difference in technology and capital intensity that's behind these differences in uh, in incomes that we observe. So in my analysis of this, I focus on three determinants of economic success. One is technology, that labor augmenting technical change is a major source of growth, and I'll elaborate on what that means a bit. Uh, the new technologies that are developed over time in rich countries uh, use more capital uh, per worker, and they're not they're frequently not cost effective in poor countries where labor is very cheap and it doesn't pay to uh, substitute a lot of capital for labor. So there's a poverty trap that emerges and I want to develop that theme. Second thing I want to talk about is globalization. So the world is becoming increasingly globalized and globalization has had the effect of amplifying these technology differences, intensifying them by leading to furthering industrialization in rich countries and deindustrializing poor countries. And this is an important source of this kind of difference in incomes we see. I'm going to talk about that. And then policy, economic policy, I think, is quite important in the way countries have responded to the challenges of technology and globalization. And some have used policy effectively and some haven't. So we want to look at that. So my analysis is different from the common analyses, at least among economists today. Uh, most explanations of 
uh, world global inequality and unequal development focus on things like culture, uh, political institutions, property rights, or scientific knowledge. Um, and I don't find these explanations generally convincing. If you look at the period of the Industrial Revolution, they don't distinguish Britain from other countries, for instance, so they can't explain why the Industrial Revolution was British. Uh, and uh, on the ideological plane, I'm not saying this is the motivation of the people that advance these hypotheses, but the effect of these hypotheses is to absolve the economic system of responsibility for poverty and inequality in the world today by transferring it to deficiencies in culture or bad institutions. And uh, I want to ar argue to you today that, uh, that um, uh, the normal operation of the free market economy is an important contributor to global inequality and explain how that's so.